So, hi, my name is Zihan. Uh, I'm a moving image and a performance artist based in Singapore. I also teach on the side. Uh, I was teaching at the School of the Arts, which is a specialized art school for high school students in Singapore. It's a new initiative. Uh, I, I just stopped teaching there uh, at the end of this year so that I can focus on my practice next year. But teaching and education is also part of my practice. So basically, Brother Kane was a performance that was done in 1993-1994. Uh, it was on New Year's Day of 1994, uh, which is uh, like almost 21 years ago, exactly to the day. Uh, in a couple of days, it will be 31st of December. So basically, it was an independent art space in Parkway Parade, Singapore, which is on the east coast of Singapore. And there was this performance artist called Joseph Ng, who did a performance piece titled Brother Kane as part of a larger event called the Artist General Assembly over two weeks. Uh, so it was one performance in a larger group of performance and that performance art was one of many, many mediums along with video art, spoken word, forums, uh, literary panels and so on and so forth that was happening at the same event. Uh, and there happened to be a few people from the tabloid newspaper in Singapore called The New Paper and they were there uh, and according to my research it seems like they were there consciously looking for something sensational to report in the papers because it's an annual event and it has happened before. So in the previous years, if you look back at the newspapers, they have always latched on to a certain performance. Uh, the previous year was Vincent Liao, who is also a very established Singaporean artist. He was performing the act of drinking his own urine from a coffee cup, and that got into the newspapers. So this year, it felt like the new paper was back to look for something sensational, to write an expose on. And they happened to be present for Joseph's performance. Joseph's performance was not the most controversial but it happened to be the ones that he, they were around for. And there was a segment in Joseph's 20-minute performance, probably about a 10-second to 20-second segment, where he turned his back to the audience, walked to the far end of the gallery, lowered his briefs just slightly, and snipped off some of his pubic hair, and used that as part of a prop in his performance itself. The whole intention was that he was protesting against the entrapment of homosexuals in public cruising areas in Singapore back in 1993. The police were still actively entrapping homosexual people who were cruising. Um, and Joseph was in response and in protest to that. Uh, of course, the context is lost in the newspaper report. They latched on to the moment and the photographer took a photograph of him with his briefs slightly lower back towards the us and that became uh, the cover on the new paper on the following week and it resulted in a whole chain of events uh, uh, resulting in the National Arts Council in Singapore uh, having to respond publicly and releasing a statement as to why they are supporting art spaces like the Passage which is the independent art space that hosted this event and also why are they supporting artists like Joseph uh, so the stand they took was a very firm and immediate one. They decided to impose a restriction on the licensing and funding of performance art. At that time, nobody knew when it was going to end. Uh, people just knew that it was implemented. So there was no limit. They, are not, they, they didn't even state 10 years. They just imposed it. And another medium that was persecuted was also forums theatre. Uh, Forum theatre is basically kind of like playback theatre uh, where uh, they perform a play and audiences are spec actors and they come in to substitute uh, the, the, the actors uh, as part of the piece and they, it's kind of empowering and kind of protest uh, kind of for the oppressed. Um, so those two forms, their licensing and funding were restricted. Fit Passage as a, as a space was forced to close down the lease was taken back uh, by the management of the, uh, the shopping centre where they were based. Uh, and also uh, the gallery manager for Fifth Passage was charged in court for providing entertainment without a valid licence because the licence expired on 12 midnight 
and the performance itself of Joseph happened at 1 a.m. So uh, there was a whole series of appeals that went back and forth and it went up to the High Court. But she still lost the case. Uh, and the, of course, the last person that was impacted uh, directly because of this was Joseph. Uh, so the government issued a statement saying that any performance that had his name or is associated with Joseph uh, won't be given license and funding. Uh, and there was also another performance artist that was involved in this, which was Shannon Tam, uh, whose performance was also reported in the paper. So basically these two people were blacklisted in a way. Um, and even till now we are not sure that they will come back in the country because Joseph has never tried to apply for a license or funding after that particular incident. So that's the background story. It's quite long. Uh, so fast forward, uh, I was in Chicago, and as I recounted, you know, I had to account for why this phenomenon happened in Singapore. So I decided at that time to do a reenactment of Joseph's piece, perhaps as my way of embodying it and also contextualizing it for people who were wanting to understand. Uh, so at that time, I embodied it according to a script or according to a text. It's an affidavit used in the trial because Joseph was charged in court uh, for committing an obscene act in public space to it. And he, was, he pleaded guilty and he was fined about $1,000. Um, so as part of that trial, they had to collect eyewitness accounts. And basically another performance artist, Ray Langeva, he actually wrote a uh, word by word breakdown, minute by minute breakdown of the performance. And I use that text account to reconstruct Joseph's performance in Chicago. So that was the first step. And after that, I documented it and I put it online. Uh, and um, people in Singapore reacted to it. And I got an invitation from Alvin Tan from the Necessary Stage uh, to come back and restage it uh, as part of the Fringe Festival in the subsequent year. Uh, and I decided to take on that invitation. I graduated, came back, did more research, and I felt that just a straight on reenactment wouldn't be enough, especially in Singapore where people are aware of the context. It's not like when I was doing it in Chicago where I was educating them on something that they probably didn't understand or didn't know. So in Singapore, how do I make it relevant and, uh, uh, for this local uh, audience? Uh, I decided to present six different accounts of the same performance from different perspectives. And that became Kane uh, in 2012. Uh, that's probably the documentation you watch. So I provided the media's account. So I read quotes from the newspaper articles. Uh, I also got Ray to come back to Singapore um, to read his eyewitness account that I based my performance on in Chicago. I screened the documentation of my performance in Chicago and at the same time I perform live in cadence with the documentation. So that's a live embodiment, the third and the fourth account. One is documented in Chicago, one is live in the space. The fifth account, I found a documentation that Ray actually hid away. He didn't want it to be exposed uh, at that time and used in the court of law. So there's a documentation of the original performance on video and it has never been screened in a public space before. So I decided to persuade Ray and he agreed, thankfully, uh, to me screening it in Singapore. So that was the fifth account, the original video documentation. And the sixth account is inviting initially Joseph to come back to Singapore and we'll have a dialogue about it. But his performative uh, or curatorial uh, gesture was to invite a Thai performance artist, Michael Sean Osai, uh, to come back in his stead. So he was performing Joseph. Our brother came and he did. He participated in the Q and A. So there were the six accounts. Yeah, there's more, but I'll stop there for now. <laughs>
as documentation from tonight's performance is uploaded for public access. I hope you enjoy the performance. Thank you. One minute. Joseph Ng said that he heard flipping hair can be a form of silent protest. I heard that flipping hair can be a form of silent protest. I heard that a clean shave can be a form of silent protest. <laughs> so basically, this used to be Action Theatre, uh, which is one of the theatre companies in the past. Uh, and it, basically, all the Singaporean art. One thing that is very short in Singapore is space, of course. Like, for example, me and a lot of other artists, we don't have studios. Especially if your practice is like performance or like film, you, you don't really have a studio space. Uh, and most arts groups in Singapore, they are under arts housing scheme. So the National Arts Council of Singapore parcels out a few spaces like this and uh, give it a, a subsidised rate to arts group. To, and there are spaces in Singapore like the Goodman campus or the Aliwal campus, which is a group of, in a cluster of artist studios and theatre groups. So this space used to be Action Theatre. And uh, earlier this year, it was uh, revamped into uh, and, and provide, given to another group, uh, which is called Centre 42. And the whole impetus of that group is to sustain uh, and to record and to archive 
uh, Singapore's theatre history. So they work a lot with text and they work also with a lot of documents and libraries. Uh, so uh, it's quite ambitious because we have never had a space like this in Singapore before and we are quite excited to see where it will go. And that's also the reason why they will support me in my next project, which is also archival. Um, I'm working to do a project that involves uh, Paddy Chu, which is the first person who came out publicly as, uh, with HIV in Singapore in 1998. And he did a play about his own experience coming out in 1999. It's called Completely Without Character. And again, my practice is to revisit all these works. So uh, next year's Fringe Festival in Singapore, I'm going to present uh, documentation from that work in this space right here. And I in uh, this is sort of the incubator space where I research and try out stuff. So a lot of people are under the, because of my previous work, Kane, a lot of people are under the impression that I'm going to perform as Paddy. Uh, but no, my research process is I look at the archive documents and I see what it's offering to me and I respect that document and create the piece around it. I needed to embody Joseph because that was what that text or that work needed. Whereas in this case, I'm not going to embody Paddy, but I'm stitching together the video documentation of his performance, uh, and I'm presenting it in this space as a cinematic experience. So you come into the space and you watch three different screens in this space, projecting his performance. Two of them are a two-camera setup shooting the same performance. So you see the same performance from different angles. And the third is the multimedia projection that was happening behind him. Uh, so hopefully, by piecing these three fragments together, you will get a sense of how the original performance was like. And this, this space up here, and the space we were downstairs, that's going to be the control room. So everything will be piped down downstairs, and uh, that will be where all the operators are. Uh, and, that, and downstairs will also be where the reader is cited. So one thing that was uh, the documentation itself was lacking was the quality of the audio because the camera was positioned in the audience and recording from the audience perspective. So sometimes you can't hear what Paddy is saying, especially when the audience is laughing or they are, they are, they are clapping uh, and it drowns out Paddy's voice. So one way to work around it creatively and to add to the production itself is I invited a different person every night to come in to read the transcript. So he will be dubbing it live. So as the documentation is playing, you'll be hearing the dub of a person performing it live. And that person is someone associated with the original production or uh, yeah, uh, and the issues that it was trying to represent. So that's the concept for this piece. あなたが今まで作ってきた映像作品に比べて感傷できる人というのは全部減ると思うんですけど見に来れる人の数と減ると思うんですけどそういうことについてはどう思いますか？うん、even when I'm doing live performances, it's also performance for a camera. So even in Kane, he was very consciously performing for the two camera setup, and because of I'm sure you have observed the technical awareness. So <laughs> I'm very conscious as a performer also where the camera is placed and how it's recording me. Uh, and that's also part of the... So it's not just performing for a live audience, but also performing for the future audience or the virtual audience beyond the camera. So my, my belief is that the performance or the record of the performance, it reaches a live audience in that present moment but you document it and it's always my philosophy to make it accessible online for as many audiences in the future for a virtual audience. Yeah. And it's very calibrated because I designed the performance for not just the live audience but also for the virtual audience. 
and that's the difference between a person who is just performing for a live audience and the documentation is incidental which is or is not choreographed by the performer whereas in my performances I'm choreographing how I document myself yeah. and it's for that virtual extended audience and it's fine I'm not precious about the live presence I understand there's a certain power in performing live but I also think there's a certain power in making it accessible. Uh, it's a different kind of, 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 of relationship with the screen and the body, but there's still that relationship and it's just how we negotiate with it. Yeah. So like for example yourself, you got to see Kane via the video documentation in Japan and learn about the information regarding that particular piece. That's what a valid and legitimate way of assessing the performance. テキストやテキストドキュメントがモートメティックからそのケインではジョセフをやったけどほとんどまでチューブやる必要はないっていうことがあったけどとそのどう What do I decide to leave out? And what do I decide to include? And how do I decide to include? That's a very good question. Uh, and it actually comes from my background as a teacher. You know, I've seen a lot of students who want to do everything or their desire is to include everything. And I find my role as an educator effective in a way I see my role as, as teaching them how to discern or to differentiate or to decide what to include and what to leave out. Because by including everything, they are not, or telling everything or showing everything, they are not doing a favor for the work. Uh, because perhaps the different people have different saturation points different people have uh, a capacity, a limit to how much they can take or assess. And by showing everything, you're not produce, putting the work in the best light. So I see my role as selecting, and I understand it's problematic, but somebody has to take on the role of selecting information uh, and to present and position those information beyond raw data, especially in our time. Uh, we are suffering from too much data online and we are able to assess this huge amount of data. The only thing that differentiates us from a computer is our ability to decide which is valuable and which should be seen, which should be echoed or which should be broadcasted in a way. And, and I think that's an important role and that's what makes us human, you know the fact that we can select and we can decide. Yeah. And I see that as the artistic practice, how to package information, select information, and display. That's that. Maybe you want to... I've always think that, okay, recently, more so than ever, my medium, other people's medium is more tangible, but my medium is information. And my practice is the shaping of information.
not in the recent times. So not the next few projects will all be related to past historical texts. And if I do break out of this mode of operation, I would say that it's if I leave the country. I think there's an importance. Now there are two main reasons. Uh, in Singapore, you know, if I continue my practice in Singapore, uh, there's always a history of amnesia. To quote a Singaporean uh, poet playwright, Alfin Saad, he says that Singapore suffers from a history of amnesia. Uh, so we forget very easily, um, especially we have a very short uh, history and trajectory. So uh, it doesn't surprise me, and it probably won't surprise many people, that a lot of young people, or the younger generation, or even my generation, they don't know who Paddy is, they don't know who Joseph is, they never heard of that incident, they didn't know that performance I was there. So there's a hunger or there's a need for us to reflect and, and look at our own history. It's short, but there's a history. And if we don't do it ourselves, then who is going to do it? If we don't address this gap in a memory, who is going to address it? So as long as I'm based here in Singapore, I think reenacting and looking at past historical texts uh, is more meaningful for me at this point in time. Uh, and it also is in line with the larger conversation over appropriation of images and text. You know, uh, in our current time, can we produce something new? Is it? Are we able to produce something new? That's the question that everybody is asking. Um, and my answer is that instead of this unsustainable desire for pursuing the new, maybe there's a possibility of looking at the past. And that's more sustainable, and that's more meaningful. Yeah. The other parallel reason, I'm dealing with bureaucratic structures in Singapore. My thesis is that performance art, in its most naive sense, can never occur in Singapore. Because whenever you stage a performance, you are asking for validation. And if we look at the fundamental basis of spontaneous performance, there is no need for legitimization or validation or asking permission from the state. But the state has imposed up upon us that in order to stage a performance, you need a license, you need to get funding, you need to look for permission. And that in itself eliminates any possibility of performance art in Singapore in the, to, to be as quote unquote authentic or real in quotation marks. So grappling with that, instead of trying to pretend that we are spontaneous, which is what a lot of artists do, they ignore the fact that we are being restricted, or they refuse, or they try not to tell the audience that, oh, my act is not spontaneous because I've already asked permission for it. You know, they pretend that there's no restrictions on them. Instead of turning a blind eye to it, I see my role as exposing those bureaucratic structures as exposing the fact that, you know, in order to stage this performance, this is the number of permission or licenses that I have to ask for, and this is the process. So tonight what you are seeing is not performance, because nothing is spontaneous, nothing is authentic, everything is recreated. So that's the two things, looking into our own history, and also dealing and exposing bureaucratic structures in Singapore. So as long as I remain practicing in Singapore, it would likely continue along this trajectory of doing reenactments.
下げた方が良いと考えているですね。例えばその誰にとってもあんまり重要じゃない事実っていうのを扱っているんですね。とこうそ,そのこそのことを、ね、なぜそうしているかというのをとまあ割とうまく。英語で説明してくれていると思ったのがあるので、とこうの今日持ってきたんですけど、どうしよう。ですか。一応どういう内容かというと、何時中。<笑>私はそれを聞いて、私はそれを聞いて、私はそれを聞いて、私はそれを聞いて、私はそれを聞いて。全く違う。No, but it's okay, it's valid, huh? No? Okay. そうえま,まずそういうふうに、えっと、そういうふうにどっかに置いておくってことが人にはできてしまうってことそだからどんなに重要なことを扱ってもこうでその時はどんなに親身に考えたりこう後で検索しようとか思って調べてあこんな人が過去にいたんだというふうなことを思ったとしてもそういうふうに,ううふうに置いておくっていうこともできてしまうでできるなら僕はそれをさせたくないでむしろ、うん、とつまり重要だねっていうところに置けないことによって。あれは何なんだよっていうのを,をずっと与えた方が、えっと、より効果があるんじゃないかというふうに思う。Yeah, no, I think it's very valid and I agree. You know, as with sometimes when we have contention, you know, it's usually we agree on the same point.、Uh, I think there's a responsibility for us, for me, example, when I take on a particular work,、uh, not To allow it to fade out of consciousness without people contemplating it enough. So, in a way, I'm, I'm taking on Brother Kane, I'm taking on without, I'm trying to reject 
uh, and resist um, uh, the fact that it's fading uh, and, and not allow it to fade because there's a, uh, there's a need to constantly remind or to introduce this information into their lives. And then I think the point of contention here would be a matter of aesthetical choice and taste. Um, um, perhaps we regard didactic choices in different ways. I see if I am very didactic about it, that is not something that I'm comfortable with. But perhaps it's also ethically a little bit problematic. Yeah. I think a lot of times we suffer from the weight of history or the burden of history or memory police. I experience it a lot with doing Cain. Like everybody will tell me who is allowed to remember what or who is allowed to perform who or how are you supposed to remember this because they have been around or they have been there or I was present, you know. So it becomes a contestation of who is allowed to say or pronounce this history. And the similarity between both Joseph Ng's Cain and Paddy Chu's Complete Without Character is that I wasn't present at both. So if you talk about it, if you want to talk about legitimate reason for reproducing these performances, I'm illegitimate. I have no reason at all. And I have no valid you know, uh, 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 validity, you know to produce these works. But I think that's exactly why I'm producing it. Who, who is to say I cannot talk about these works? Who is to say that the next generation of people cannot investigate these works? Yeah, it's opening up that can of worms, opening up potential for that. Thank you. 